Let's start by turning to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8 and verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. How excellent is God's name. Brethren, how often do we really pause and take time to reflect upon and meditate about God's name? I think it's important because having a fuller understanding of God's name is a key to our ability to have a keener and deeper insight into his very nature and being, understanding God himself. A person is, of course, identified by their name. Each of us has a name. And throughout the course of his or her life, one's name becomes associated typically with a certain level of character or type of morals. A particular name can become synonymous with that person's reputation and their basic na nature and being. I'd like to have an experiment, not experiment, we'll do a little demonstration here. Could you all close your eyes for the next 30 seconds or so? Eyes closed. Nimrod, Queen Jezebel, Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin. What comes to your mind when you hear that? How do you feel when you hear those names read? Your thinking probably is associated with some words like arrogance and murder, ungodliness, brutality, a lot of negative behavior. You remain with your eyes closed still. Noah, Daniel, Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa. Now what comes to mind? You may open your eyes now. Do you feel very different when you mention those names? What image is present inside of you when contemplating those individuals? Do you think about their good works, their character? In a similar manner, God himself reveals who he is and how he is and what he is through his name. His name gives us insight into his true nature, his basic makeup, his inner being, his moral character. Now, unfortunately, because religion in general, and Christianity in particular, oftentimes there has been committed some horrible crimes in the name of religion, and oftentimes because theologians, authors, scholars, and leaders can twist the Bible and misrepresent true Christian values, God's name is often held in disdain, and disregard, and contempt, and ridicule by men. Now, for those of us who have been called by God to understand his wonderful plan of salvation and to be able to meet on a regular basis, we understand the very nature of God and his wonderful plan, we have, we have tended to be a much more positive view of God's name than that. And in today's message, I would like to examine God's name in order to better appreciate that great being whom we serve. In this message, let's review God's name in order to see what kind of God it is that we worship, his very nature and character, and we can do this simply by studying his name. Throughout scripture, God has many titles, many names indeed, we're going to only focus upon one of those. We will investigate how God reveals himself in the Old Testament, and then for the second half of the sermon, we will turn our attention to Jesus Christ, who clearly said that he came to reveal the Father, elaborating even further on this uh, nature of God, the name of God. The title of my sermon is, I Am, Two Little Words with Big Meaning. I Am, Two Little Words with Big Meaning. About 400 years after migrating to Egypt to survive the widespread famine during Joseph's time, Israel, the descendants of Jacob, were suffering in bondage, and God saw their suffering, he saw their plight, he heard their cries of anguish, and he initiated a process and uh, used Moses to bring them out of slavery, and of course his wonderful works and, and miracles, and to work with them as a nation. Let's turn to the book of Exodus and notice something about God's name here. We'll be reading from chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. So when the law saw that Moses turned aside to look, he called to Moses in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. So God called Moses here, the burning bush incident. Verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. We heard about that in the sermon. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look upon God. 
Verse 8. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place where the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites all will dwell. Verse 11. But Moses is objecting here, and finally God has had enough of it, but initially he just says this. Moses said to God in verse 11, Who am I that I should care about the children of the uh, okay. I'm not going back into this. And so he said, I will certainly do and this shall be here. a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God in this mountain. Verses 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall speak to the children of Israel and say, I am has sent me to you. So this is the first time that God was called by that I am name. God had revealed himself before, and we see this in Exodus chapter 6, Exodus 6, verses 1 to 3, but not by the name I am. Exodus 6, verses 1 to 3. Then the Eternal said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let you go, let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of the land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Eternal. I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty, as El Shaddai. But by my name, Lord, or Eternal, or Yahweh, as we'll see in a bit, I was not known to them. So this is the first time God was called by this name. I am. In Hebrew, uh, there were no, no vowels in the text, so it's Y-H-V-H. Scholars refer to this as the Tetragrammaton, because Tetra means four, and Grammaton is letter. So four letters make up the I am God name in Hebrew. This I am is also refer referenced or referred to by others as the covenant name of God, the personal name of God, or the sacred name of God. And of course, some people get into um, sacred names and kind of go off the rails. But uh, all these three, the covenant, personal, and sacred names of God, were all attributed to, or they were variations of the definition and components of the I am relationship that he had with other people. People looked up to him and worshipped him. Okay? Now, when the Jews returned from the post-exile period, uh, returned to Judah from Babylon, YHVH was withdrawn from popular usage. Because people didn't know exactly how to pronounce it, they were, mis they were afraid that God would be profaned if they mispronounced the name. So the people didn't really use that. It was in, it was in the text, but they were, were afraid to say it because they didn't want to blame or rather uh, uh, smirch God's name by misspelling it or, or mispronouncing it. Now, why it's VH? The original Hebrew text, as I mentioned earlier, contained no vowels. And so one is at, you know, certain to, to not, not certain to know how to be pronounced. Many use Jehovah. Some use Yahweh, but we really don't know for sure what the correct of, pronunciation of it was. <coughs> now, Y-H-V-H is normally translated as the Lord in the Old Testament. Most versions uh, actually capitalize L-O-R-D, the entire word is highlighted. And if you turn a concordance, it gives various meanings to that word as, as eternal or self-existent one. And from the Hebrew word translated as to exist, to become, or to come to pass. Now the tradition in the Church of God has been to read that as the eternal. And there's nothing wrong with that. Another interesting thing I found out in my research is the Tetragrammaton may be a combination of Hebrew words kind of scrunched to, together in an abbreviated uh, fashion. So it, it may be that Yahweh or YHVH means is, or what rather was, is, and will be. In other words, the past, present, and the future. The three tenses of the form of the verb to be. Let's get a verification of this from the scriptures. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4 and verse 8. 
Four living creatures, each having six wings, who are full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The ever-living one. I always was in eternity past. I am today, and I will be so forevermore. In uh, Hebrews 7, verse 3, Hebrews 7, 3, we won't go there, but it describes Jesus Christ there as having no beginning nor end. So the eternal is probably a very fitting way to translate the YHVH into the English. So, the I am name of God reveals to us his eternal existence, that he's lived forever. He has always existed, he is alive today, and will live forward on to, into eternity. But is that all there is to this name, to understanding the I am God? Scholars have suggested various interpretations or perspective on this name of God with different implications other than the fact that God lives forever. At least three other major ideas I'd like to review with you as the real significance of why HVHIM have been suggested. First of all, you have the present meaning. The present meaning of the word. I am here. I am really present. I am ready to help. I am close by. And that can be a very comforting thing to view God in that way. The second perspective I'd like to briefly talk about is the causative meaning. The causative. I cause to be. I cause what comes into existence. I'm the creator of all and the one who directs history. And then thirdly, I'd like to look briefly at the deterministic meaning, the deterministic meaning. This is God saying, I will be who I will be. I will do what I want to do, and no one can force me or tell me to do otherwise. I am the sovereign God. Are any of these three perspectives on the YHVH, the meaning of the word correct? Is one of them right to them wrong or anything? Let's review some scriptures to see if there is biblical support for these conceptual, conceptual views of God or interpreting the I am the YHVH, name of God. So the present meaning, I am here, I am really present, I'm ready to help. Let's turn to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. And we'll read the, read the entire uh, psalm here, it's not too long. God is our refuge and our strength. And think of this in a present meaning, that God is nearby, he's ready to help. God is our strength and, pre and, and very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as the break, at, the, at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdom was moved, he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of our God of Jacob is our refuge. So that's the present meaning, that God is there, ready and willing to help us. How about the cause of meaning? I cause to be, I cause what comes into existence. I'm the creator of all and the one who sets history, sets the course of the world of history. Revelation chapter 4. We were there before. Really in the sermon. So instead of verse 8, we'll look at verse 11. 24 elders are saying this. Revelation 4 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. A reference scripture which we won't turn to, but just for, for your um, benefit. Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah 40 and verse 28 refers to God as the creator of the ends of the earth. So there's two scriptures that seem to support the causative meaning of God, 
and would be applicable as a perspective on the YHVH, or the I Am God name. Deterministic. I will be who I will be, I will do what I want to do, and no one can force me or tell me to do otherwise. The very last chapter of Job, or Job begins. Job chapter 42. And verse 2. Job 42, 2. Speaking to God, Job says, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. It's very, very clear that God is in charge, He is sovereign. Let's turn to a second scripture here for the deterministic meaning as a perspective on God's name. Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah 46, verses 9. Ten. Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So looking at these, it seems like there's some scriptural support for these various perspectives of the I am name of God. And looking at these interpretations, number two and three seem kind of closely related to one another. The way I look at it is the distinction there is the deterministic meaning is more of the personhood of Jesus Christ and, and the Father, whereas the causative meaning refers to the actions that might come from that person. So thus far, the I am God, this Yahweh, can be seen to be eternal, the ever-present, creator of uh, the earth and all things that exist, the one who writes history, and the one who determines the future and accomplishes his will. When God came to earth in the peace of the person of Jesus Christ, then, there is even a further and deeper understanding and revelation that the I am God of the Gospel of John will show us. The fourth Gospel of John's Gospel, seven times in that Gospel, Jesus states, I am then followed by some metaphor or symbol that in some manner describes Jesus' character or reflects his nature and his life's work and ministry. Jesus Christ, who was that Yahweh, that I am God, seven times likens himself to something else in order to further reveal to us the Father and the nature of God. To us Christians today, as much as, as 2,000 years ago. So let's now briefly go through each of those seven I am of Jesus Christ. Number one, excuse me. Number one, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. John chapter six. Verses 26 and 27. First of all. Jesus answered and said, Truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and the fish and were filled. But do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, because God the Father was, has set his seal on him. Verses 32 and 33. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. <laughs> For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verses 47 to 51, Truly I say to you that he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, yet are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Verses 53 to 58. Truly I say to you, unless you eat of my flesh the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. 
As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, but he who eats this bread will live forever. During the temptation, what happened? What was the first, at least written down in the scripture, what was the first temptation that Satan used on Jesus Christ? Try to exploit his fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Turn these rocks into bread. To which Jesus responded, in Matthew 4.4, 4, which is taken from Deuteronomy 8.3, Man shall not live by bread alone, but he shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Brethren, it's very important that we partake of Jesus Christ, the living word. We must do that daily, get spiritual nourishment through prayer, through study, through, through uh, Bible study. The Israelites had to gather the manner, of course, on a daily basis, right? They couldn't go out and get three days worth and hoard it away because it didn't keep overnight except Friday night into Saturday to demonstrate the Sabbath. So they could they had to do it was a daily task, a daily necessity that they went through in order to be fed spiritually. In 1 Corinthians 10 3, Paul simply says, all ate of that spiritual food, which is the bread of life, Jesus Christ. The number two, I am of John, of Jesus in the book of John. Number two, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12. John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In the Bible, of course, light is often used as a metaphor or symbol for goodness and truth and righteousness as contrasted to darkness, which symbolizes wickedness and falsehood and unrighteousness. In the light of day, you can see how things are. And because of that, a lot of people didn't want their deeds to be known because of the light. That's why they didn't, didn't want to be exposed. But when you're in the dark, you're stumbling around because you can't see the obstacles or the, the, the train ahead. You really don't know what's going on. And you are very apt to stumble on something if you walk in darkness. So darkness is compared to light. In John chapter 1, where it talks about the Word before the creation, even, the Word came to earth then as the true light. But as I mentioned earlier, people rejected it because their deeds were dark. Their deeds were evil. They were in spiritual darkness. Let's turn to John chapter 3 to elaborate on this light of the world idea. John chapter 3. Verses 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So clear illustration there of the symbolism of spiritual light versus spiritual darkness. The third I am. I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. John 10, 7. Then Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. Jesus is the only way of salvation. There is no other means that God has given to have a relationship with the Father. For sin cuts us off, as we know in Isaiah chapter 59. A door either what? Provides access to something that's inside, or it locks a person out and they're on the outside. Jesus Christ is the door, the only way to salvation. God has not provided any other method by which we can be forgiven, no other way to have a relationship with God until that sin is removed and atoned for. Scriptural verification of what we just talked about, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, and verse 12. 
nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. For your reference, Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 18, Ephesians 2, 18, it says basically that it is through him, through Jesus, that we have access to the Father. For I am the door of the sheep. Those who came before are robbers. I am the only way to salvation. The fourth I am that Jesus spoke in the Gospels of John is the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 11 to 14. John 10, 11. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by his own. So a shepherd cares for the sheep. In fact, they might even put their lives on the line, like David did twice, once with a lion and once with the bear. David mentions those two situations. The shepherd endures harsh weather, long sleepless nights. Uh, every once in a while, they might have to go after the stray one and leave the 99 uh, behind. There is so much that the shepherd does for the sheep, we don't have time to talk about it. Probably it's worthy of a, a sermon of them by itself. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 40, though. In one verse in Isaiah 40, verse 11. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. So leading them to green pastures, leading them to clean water so they can remain well nourished and hydrated. <coughs> in Hebrews, Paul refers to Jesus as the great shepherd of the, of the sheep. And in his first general epistle, Peter calls Jesus the chief shepherd. And of course, there's that very familiar psalm, Psalm 23, whose title is, of course, The Lord is My Shepherd. The fifth I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and first of all, verse 19. And many of the Jews had, yes. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Verses 23 to 25, on, verse 19. Yeah, that, that's, that's covered. Then 23 to 25. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. It's through the resurrection, it's through Jesus Christ, of course, that we can inherit immortality. The fact that we are born physical beings means that our bodies will grow old and eventually we die. And therefore, life becomes largely vain and purposeless unless there's something beyond this three score and ten or four score that we are granted in the physical realm. Let's go to the re resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And read verses 19 to 22. Paul writing here says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward those who are Christ at his coming. In verses 50 to 57, 
Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The number six I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this one has three aspects to it, the way, the truth, and the life. The first one, I am the way, that's just another means of stating that Jesus Christ is the only way to obtain salvation. Like we had in the third I am, I am the door, if you remember that, Christ is the door of the sheep. The only way in, or you will be locked out. Now the gospel of the word uses the word way instead of, uh, in, in, to convey that, that same idea. It's a way of reinforcing when Jesus said, I am the door. Well, I am the way. Same meaning in Acts 4.12, by no other name under heaven we can be saved. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 in regards to the way. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, though through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who comes is faithful. So we have a new and living way through Jesus Christ and the resurrection. The truth, which is the second aspect of the seventh I am. John chapter 17 and verse 17 simply says, God's word is truth, and Jesus is the living word. Now Jesus Christ, through his perfect life, by revealing the Father to the disciples, by preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ embodied everything that he said and did during his earthly life and ministry. I'd like to read a statement and read it a second time for emphasis. If we truly believe that Jesus is the way, then we will also believe what he taught as being the truth, the necessity to live a life of obedience to God's laws. Again, if we truly believe that Jesus is the way, then we will also believe what he taught being truth, being truth, the necessity to live a life of obedience to God's laws. John chapter 8, verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from the bondage of sin, which was pictured by the Israelites in their slavery and captivity in ancient Egypt. Find well, the true I'm the life, rather. Let's look at 1 John, for the life, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son does not have life. Let's look at just one more scripture to substantiate this sixth I am of being of God, his name. I am the true vine. Oh, I'm sorry, Galatians 2.20 first. Galatians 2.20, then we'll get to the second I am. Galatians 2.20, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. So that substantiates the life portion of that sixth I am. And now finally, the seventh I am. I am the true vine. 
Return, please, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we'll read verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the wine, vine dresser. <clears throat> every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I with him, there is much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, then he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, and God is the vine dresser of our husband. We need to be Christ corrected, connected to Jesus Christ in order to survive spiritually. If we become cut off from him, then all hope is lost. We will wither up and dry, and then be gathered as firewood and thrown into the fire. So there's really two lessons here for us as Christians in this analogy. Number one is we need to be part of the body, and number two is we need to produce fruit in our lives. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, Hebrews 12, 6 talks about the fruit of righteousness. Let us instead go to Matthew chapter 7. That's a fine scripture. Matthew chapter 7. In verse 16 through 20. 7 16 of Matthew. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So I am the way, the truth, and the true one, true vine. Brethren, who would ever think that two such simple words could have be so rich with meaning? You feel with revelations about the nature of the God whom we worship and serve. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Through the seven I am's of John's gospel, much of God's character and nature can be known. Adding even more to our knowledge of YHVH, the I am God of the Old Testament. I am the ever present one. I am the one who causes to be. I am the one who will accomplish my will. I am the eternal who was who is and is to come. I am that I am. Indeed, how great is the God we serve and how excellent his name in all the earth. 